begin. Um, welcome to this lecture. Uh, I Actually, in the plan for the, the lectures, this was sort of a buffer one, uh, one hour before Patrick's lecture, guest lecture next week, to ensure that I could complete anything I needed to before his uh, lecture. And as it turns out, I kind of completed everything that was in the main lecture plan. So I'm not sure how long this lecture is going to take. It may actually be a shorter version. Uh, what we're going to do is two things in this lecture. One is I'm going to um, go through a few more ways of playing around with the construction of these machines, essentially based on, on the concept of a virtual qubit. So in fact, when we did research on this uh, a while ago, we, we call it Lego thermodynamics because it really the feel is really good. You, you understand now the basic concept of how I generate a virtual qubit. And now I just go like, okay, let me put in many systems and try to generate the best, most powerful machine I can. Um, so that would be one, one sort of thing to discuss different ways of, of doing things with these qubits. And the other part of the lecture, if you can get to it, is about different paradigms of quantum thermodynamics. So somehow every time you read a paper, um, each one of them will use slightly different language and may have a slightly different starting point, as in this is a set of assumptions we have, and now we're going to see what we can do with this set of assumptions. So these are two things we can, we're can we going to talk about, loosely speaking. So it'll be a smattering of topics. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the following. So yesterday, was yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday we did the details of the three qubit fridge. Um, and I, I claim that I was, in one, some sense, the smallest uh, possible thermal machine you could, you could uh, imagine. So somewhere in the, in the three qubit fridge and the, the engines and everything we discussed, the machine was really two qubits, right? The, the third qubit was what you wanted to cool. Or in the case of an engine, you had the third system being a ladder, for example. So really speaking, what we did is we generated a machine from two qubits. And the way we did it is, so let me do it for the case of the fridge. We have two systems. Um, one of which I connect, the, the bigger one I connect to the room temperature. And the smaller energy gap I connect to a hot temperature. And then that is equivalent to getting this four level system. And this is our, our virtual qubit here, which is really looks like it's at beta V, which is beta room E room minus beta hot. E hot upon E room minus E hot. And of course, the way I do this is I consider, yeah, I consider this, this to be thermalized to beta R and this one to be thermalized to beta hot. So actually the first comment I would make today, which I didn't make yesterday is um, one of the things that you see when you read different papers and on the topic is the semantics of what they will call cold, room, hot, environment, bath, this sort of shift because of course every person has something that they're used to. So the main thing when you're looking at it as, oh, I want to see it as a thermal machine, what you have to identify is which is the heat path that is acting as a source. And typically this is the one that's the hottest. And which is the one that's acting as a sink in the sense that in the end heat is being dumped there as sort of an entropy sink. So in the lecture yesterday, I called that one hot and room. But sometimes, for example, people might call this cold, even though then it's not really the cold bath, it's just the room temperature bath and so on. So this, these letters might change. You just have to sort of associate, well, there's a source, there's a sink, and that's from where the flow between them is, our, is how we construct a machine. OK, now, this is the smallest possible machine you can do if on every local system, so in this case, I had one qubit and one qubit, you can just construct a thermal state. But you could do something even smaller if you're allowed to do um, if you're allowed to thermalize within systems, different parts of the system. So for example, an even smaller fridge would be the following. I have a Qtrit. Okay, so this is states zero, one, two. And what I do is rather than couple this whole Qtrit to a bath, I couple only particular transitions. So I couple this one here to beta room. And I couple that's either way it would work. So let's do it this way. I couple this one to beta hot. Okay. Now, an immediate question is how you would do this. So there's the practical question of how you would do this. Uh, this is, in fact, possibly the earliest example of thermal machine because the paper that describes this, it's called a three level maser. Um, 
it was actually sometime in the 50s, maybe 57, 58 or so. So if you if you look at the three-level maser, you'll find a very old paper that does this. And the way they do this is by essentially having lasers at, at these frequencies. So you can really then tune into a particular transition in the system. If you wanted to write this as a Limbladian, you could also do that. You just have to say, well, you have to have two dissipators, 0, 2, and 2, 0, and the ratio of between them, the constants, as, as discussed, has to be the Gibbs ratio. Anyway, what would happen if I did something like this and I say, well, what do I expect the state of the system to be? And in, in particular, what I would like to look at is, is this transition here. Well, then I can, I can easily calculate this. I say, well, the population, once I allow these two things to thermalize, the population of one upon the population of zero, well, I can just write this as P1 upon P2, P2 upon P0. And then these, of course, so P1 upon P2 is my e to the plus beta hot e hot. This is e to the minus beta room e room. And this I associate with a virtual temperature. So it's beta V, uh, sorry, e hot is now, let me put this actually in. So the hot one is coupled to e2 minus e1. And the room one is coupled to e2 minus, well, e2, I taking e0 as zero. zero. And this one is coupled to E1. And the end result is really the same, same thing that you have there. So you, you will get beta V is equal to beta room E2 minus beta hot E2 minus E1 upon E1. And E1 is really the difference, E2 minus E2 minus E1. So it really has the same form as this one. It's, it's exactly the same thing, same principle. But here you see you've actually, instead of using four levels, with two into two, you've used three levels. So um, so yeah, so this already, when I was talking about thermodynamic paradigms, one of the, the things that distinguishes different thermodynamic paradigms is the starting of assumption of how much control you have over your system. And this is one example. Here, my control is, Every system can be brought to into contact with a the thermal state, whereas here I have even more control. Every individual transition can be brought to a particular temperature. So it's one example of that. Okay, so, um, and yeah, you can do a lot of other things. So for instance, in um, if I do have two qubits and I am allowed to do coupling to any transitions, so now I can, I can look at the, uh, the joint state of two qubits. Uh, one zero, one one, and rather than the individual ones being coupled to a temperature, I don't do that. Instead, I look at the joint system, and then I do something like, let's say, I couple this one here to a room temperature. Uh, yeah, to the room temperature, and the inner one to a hot temperature. So this is just another way of doing it, and. Um, what you will find then is that, so that the things that are not coupled now are, are these two. And what you find is that you, you end up acting as a fridge on these two transitions. So the one, one, zero to one, one transition and the zero, zero to zero, one transition, which is effectively a fridge on B, the second system, because you can see for the zero, it's basically a fridge on the zero to one of the second system, regardless of what state A is in. So I'm not going to do this calculation, but the, the result of this is that then if you, if you had now two qubits A and B, B is now being cooled. So if it was connected to a bath, you would see that you could draw heat from that bath. Okay. Uh, one of the ways of understanding this, which is helpful to think of it as Lego thermodynamics, is that every time you draw a connection to the colder bath, you, it's not ex you, you imagine somehow an arrow in the bottom direction. So this is really... What you're really doing when you're connected to a lower temperature bath is you're trying to go downwards. What you do when you're connected to a hotter temperature bath is you're trying to go upwards. Now, this is not entirely accurate because even if, as long as the temperature is positive, you still always have more population in the lower one than in the higher one. It's just that in comparison with the blue one, this one is weighted more towards being in a higher level. So essentially, once you do draw these arrows, you realize, aha, what, is, what have I constructed here? I've constructed here something that goes from one to two and from two to zero. So it's really trying to go from one to zero. I'm cooling down one zero. So now with this, you say, okay, I can play around with this concept. So here as well, you do the same thing. Since I have going from 
this way, and from that way, you see that the state being the states being emptied are this one and that one. The states being put into are this one and this one, and so you end up cooling the ground state of B because you end up you end up putting more population whenever B is in the state zero. Okay, so this is one way of understanding it. Um, and so what that lends itself to then is let me I still have space. Yes, let me put something more on this board. This space. So you could consider then, okay, if I have, imagine that I have something like these sort of qubits or this sort of qtrit or particular energy gaps that I can connect to a certain temperature. Now, I can create a virtual temperature by you know, using three energy levels, but can I do something better if I use more and more energy levels? And so now this, this now takes us into the field of the concatenating Thermal machines. So one such way that I'm going to describe uh, loosely, and, and I would leave it to anybody who's interested to do the calculation, but it, it is rather simple, is so I take the Qtrit. In fact, let me have some more space. So I take this Qtrit here, right? I want to, let's say I want to generate a, yeah, okay, so I want to generate I want to generate a fridge on the lower transition, okay? So my original way of doing it was, well, I couple this to a cold temperature and I couple, oh, right, to, I couple this to a cold temperature and I couple this to a hot temperature. Okay, so that I've just repeated that one now. And then this is a fridge here. But now I can say, well, what I can do here is rather than couple this to a hot temperature, I can couple it to a heat pump. So now I go, I use a machine to actually heat this up even hotter than just coupling it. And the, the simplest way of doing so is to couple it to another Qtrit. So I have a second Qtrit. I use identical Qtrits for simplicity. Now, I'm going to couple this transition to this one. So I, I know I'm going to use the interaction Hamiltonian as usual. This one to this one would be the interaction Hamiltonian one, two, two, one plus Hermitian conjugate. So that will basically couple these two. So now the question is, how do I get this to be hot? And now from what we've discussed with the construction, if I want to get this to be hot, well then the way to do it would be to couple this to a hot temperature and so this has to be hot, so we, this to a cold, to a cold temperature. Okay, so now what I've done, so if I just look at the second one now, this is a this is a heat pump on engine on this level because I'm pumping from one to zero and from zero to two. So when I look at the virtual temperature of this one, it's going to be even hotter than beta hot. Okay, and so now, and, and then to complete it, of course, I have the, let's just say the, I'm gonna represent this now by a, this just means this interaction Hamiltonian that rotates in the subspace. But now I can keep going on and f on with this. I can just take the, the smaller level here, which is supposed to be cold, and say, well, I connect it to the original thing I was constructing, which is a fridge, which is now the same thing with my, uh, and now it's yes, yes, so this is hot, and this is cold, and so on and so forth. And I can just keep doing this indefinitely, and I will get now, what am, I, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get as good a virtual temperature here as possible. And what you will find if you do this calculation, and it's, and it's kind of very simple because all I have to do when I want to find out the population of this by this is I say, well, first, uh, first of all, I go this upon this is, what do we know? It's this ratio times that ratio. And every time I have a ratio uh, of populations where I've connected that same transition via Hamilton into another one, I just say, well, that ratio should be the same as that one in the steady state. And then again, that one is equal to this by this and so on and so forth until I reach the end. And what you find is that this equation here, so this equation here, I can write down as um, beta V minus beta room times E1 is equal to 
beta room minus beta hot times E2 minus E1. Okay, I, what I did is I took E1 on this side back again, and I just subtracted E1 from both sides. So that's the equation. And what happens when we keep concatenating it? What we end up with is we keep adding N times beta room minus beta hot. I think it's times E2. Every time you add two more machines, you end up doing that. So when you add one machine, the, the thing changes slightly. And then when you add the second machine, it changes back into the original form. But you essentially keep adding this. And this would be a nice, well, simple calculation to sort of do. It was actually, it was the, maybe either the mock exam or the summer exam question last year. I can't remember. But yeah. And so you see that the, the, so of course you want beta V minus beta room to be as high as possible. That, that makes this beta V much colder. And you can see that as N, N is increases, you can make it as large as you want. In particular, you can make it well, arbitrarily close to infinity, which is the same as cooling to absolute zero, okay? And there's also, the reason I put this example is really now I've stopped writing a lot of the numbers and equations because you can, can simply do this by going, well, the blue thing is an arrow downwards, the red thing is an arrow upwards, and now I'm, I'm constructing the flow in that direction. You could also do it on a single system of high dimension. So for instance, I could have something like this where, and then something like that. So this is a Hamiltonian of a particular system. And uh, you could have that it's, and then hot, hot, hot. And this again would act as a fridge for this lowest transition here, beta V, because what you've done by, is essentially taken population and using the red ones, you're essentially influencing them to go upwards more and using the blue ones down more. So here as well, if you just, if you imagine that this is my original Q-trit machine, the three levels, and now I just keep adding two a pair of levels each time, you get the same influence. Like with every pair of levels you add, you end up getting beta room minus beta hot times that energy gap that you've had. So it's another way of doing it. Are there any questions? Okay. So perhaps a, a final thing to say there is one of the tricks with um, with these is, so there's a, like when you solve linear equations, you have this underdetermined, overdetermined, and I don't know what it's like, unique solution. I don't know what the middle term thing is usually called, but it's the same concept here. So when, when I describe the original q machine, there are three levels. So there are three populations. So if I have exactly two thermal connections, then this is precisely determined because with three populations, actually there are only two degrees of freedom. You have normalization, so everything has to add to one. So the moment I have two thermal connections, it's exactly determined and I, I have a unique solution. And when I have that, it's very easy to calculate all of the virtual temperatures because all of the ratios of things are connected to thermal uh, baths have to be exactly the Gibbs ratio of that. But one must be careful always to do it such that it is precisely determined because like yesterday in the three qubit fridge, that was not precisely determined so nicely because if we hadn't, if we had taken away one of the baths, then it would be all, again very clean because we would have had the two baths that make my virtual temp qubit and then that virtual qubit connects to the other system and determines what it is. But the moment you add the third bath, then there's a competition. Like there's a one bath that is actually competing to put something at a particular temperature and the other two are are competing. So there you get, that's why our, our thermal state is something that's a linear combination and somewhere in between what you would expect from one or the other. So in constructing thermal machines, before you connect it to an external system, you usually work in this thing where you go like, I, I'm going to have a steady state where everything that's coupled to a thermal transition is exactly that Gibbs ratio. Once you couple it to the system, so once this whole concatenation got coupled to an external system, then of course you would have, the, the steady state would be shifted slightly away from the thermal state because it would be in competition with whatever it's connected to. Okay, so that uh, concludes this part. And we have a lot of time left, very good. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about thermal paradigms. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to actually take one single example of what you might like to do in thermodynamics and then simply go through all of the different way paradigms as to how they 
they um, define the same problem. And our problem is very simple. We want to cool a qubit. So I have a qubit. So I, I write down the, the Hamilton of the qubit, which has some energy gap E. Let's call this E system. Um, and it starts in some arbitrary state. And my ma major uh, thing that I want to do is I want to take rho s towards the ground state. Okay. And I ask, well, how can I do this? So something that we've already done in this lecture, which is pretty much one of the simplest ways you could consider, consider doing this is just do a swap. So imagine that I take this qubit here and I swap it with a qubit that is of higher energy gap. Okay, so, uh, well, it doesn't matter what the energy gap is. For, for starters, just say I, I have this qubit that's in, so this is S, and let's call this B. B usually stands for the BART system. Uh, and I simply do the qubit swap among them. Well, then I know that the final state of rho S, so if I do the swap here, then rho S will just be go to rho B. So whatever the state was on, on this one here, I would get onto the system here. So how would I manage to, to use this to my advantage to cool? Well, there's one very simple thing I can do. So imagine that I pick this second qubit out of a thermal bath at room temperature. Then we know that as this energy gap gets larger and larger, the probability of being in the ground state gets larger and larger. So the higher the energy gap here, the closer the state of B is to the ground state. And so then I just pick something with a very high energy gap and I swap that state with, with S and I end up getting a, a close to the ground state. Now, what you will see is, well, and what, this is something we've calculated as well, is as you do that, the energy cost becomes higher as well, because what you're doing is the Hamiltonians are more and more different. So we get that rho s goes to rho b, but we also get that w, which is the work cost, is going to be trace of hb minus hs rho s minus rho b. I mean, this is evident. The initial initial um, initial energy is HB rho B, HS rho S, and the final energy is HS rho B and HB rho S. So that gives you that thing. So you can see that as HB becomes larger and larger, this is going to this difference is going to become larger and larger, and you're going to get to infinite work. So you can see you can cool as close to ground uh, to absolute zero as you like, just at the cost of an infinite amount of energy. So this is a very simple thing we can do. Now, this I would call a, this is something that, and different people use different terms for it, but it's just important to understand the, the conceptual differences regardless of the semantics. So I call this a coherent operation. And the reason is because the unitary you swap is not, energy preserving. So U does not commute with HS plus HP. Okay? And yeah, they, you could do that by calculation. A very easy way to say it is, well, when you do the swap, what you really do is exchange the populations of zero, one, and one, zero, and they're clearly not at the same energy unless the bath and the system are actually the same identical qubit. So this is a coherent operation, and, and you can do a whole study of what you can do, what's the best possible thing you can do with coherent operations. Now, one of the first things that one can do is you can turn this into an incoherent operation. And the very simple way of doing this is really, and this really takes us to what we've been doing with the three qubit fridges, is go, well, I have here two energy levels I want to, I want to swap. So the energy levels that we want to swap here are really, so one zero is going to swap with zero one, okay? And of course, one zero and zero one do not have the same energy. So what I can do to make this operation energy preserving is, Every time one zero swaps with zero one, I also make a change on a third system whose energy gap happens to be exactly the same. So I sort of make up for it. And that basically takes us exactly to the picture that you've been used to seeing in the case of the three qubit fridge. So 
I want to swap these two states. I simply add a third qubit with exactly the difference in energy. And now when this one, when the usual operation would happen, so say this one would go down and this one would go up, well, then I ensure that this one goes down as well. So now my swap doesn't become 0, 1, 1, 0. My swap now, so the incoherent version of it is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 plus transition conjugate. Of course, because it's a unitary, I have to add identity on the rest of the space. Okay. Now, um, of course, the so so this in a from a resource point of view, this is nice. Why? Because the first important part about coherent operations is when you have a unitary that does not commute with the Hamiltonian. This means that your unitary has to be extremely well timed or has to be performed instantaneously, because the evolution of a of a quantum system, if you have its own Hamiltonian and you have an interaction Hamiltonian. Well, then when you evolve, if the two don't commute, depending on when you uh, place the interaction Hamiltonian, you're going to get a different result. So then, you, then it becomes very important as to, okay, if I'm going to do this unitary, either I have to do this so quickly that the natural Hamiltonian doesn't have time to interfere, or I have to sort of calculate exactly when it has to be started and stopped in order to make sure that the end result is correct. This is not a problem when the unitary commutes with the Hamiltonian, because if the unitary commutes with the Hamiltonian, then you know you can shuffle the exponentials as you like. So when you do it is completely irrelevant. So basically, in the case of an incoherent operation, I really don't require as many timing resources. I can do this unitary by switching on and off an interaction at any time I want. It will not matter with respect to the system's own evolution. That's not going to be a problem. And so that, that is kind of nice. However, the cost of doing this is that you get a slightly worse answer. So one of the things that one can calculate is, so what, what would you get if you do this um, interaction with this swap instead of the original one? And again, we can understand this from the perspective of the virtual qubit. So here in the original swap, this qubit is swapping with this qubit. So we know, so we know what to expect. The final state of this one is going to look like the initial state of this one. Now in the, the modified one, this qubit is not swapping with this one. The left qubit is swapping with the virtual qubit that is formed by these two, right? So for starters, if I was to, uh, let's, let's write down the Gibbs ratios in both cases. So here, this, the left qubit is swapping with this one and the Gibbs ratio, which I can write as P1 on B upon P0 on B. So this is the Gibbs ratio that you're swapping with. Okay. But in this case here, we know that the Gibbs ratio swapping with is not the same. So it is going to be P1, P, P0. And I didn't label this one. So I call this S, I call this B. And I'm going to call this H for reasons that will become clear. So P0, H upon P0, B, P1, H. Why have I done this? Because when you look, and we've done this already, when you look at the virtual qubit that this couples to, it's going to be the ground state of that virtual qubit is going to be zero, one, and the excited state is going to be one, zero on these two systems. So this is the Gibbs ratio that you get, which is, so it's our original Gibbs ratio times P0H upon P1H. Now, Originally, for the purpose of cooling, what would you like this Gibbs ratio to be? You would like it to be as close to zero as possible. You want P1 to be much less than P0. You want as little population up there as, as uh, possible. So this being closer to zero is what helps you. And now what we've done is we've taken that ratio and we've multiplied it by P0 upon P1 on another system. So as long as that system started off at positive temperature, this is a number that is greater than one, which is something that's going to increase this ratio. So clearly, what you're swapping with now, first of all, it has a virtual temperature or, or just a Gibbs ratio that is worse than your original. So that's the first problem. But the second problem is also the other one that we noticed when we did the qubit swap. When you do the qubit swap, you don't go immediately to the state you're swapping with if you swap with a virtual qubit. You go some convex combination on the way there because the virtual qubit does not have norm one. You're only working with a subspace. So you have two problems now. The so one is um, the virtual, so that the populations are worse. And the second is 
NV is less than one. So you don't get the full, so with one swap, you're not going to get actually, you're not going to get to the state you're trying to get to, which in turn is worse than the state you had in the original one. So you see the, the trade-off between the amount of control you had, coherent versus incoherent, and the amount that you can get from a, from a single unitary operation in this case. Yes? Yes, so, indeed, so, so, so this is why now I, I said hot. And the reason is because, so the whole purpose of, when you start a cooling uh, question like this, the main thing is to say, well, what do I have for free available? And typically you say, well, I have some environment temperature for free. So that's why I said, you can pick this from the environment. And then the best thing to do is to pick this as high in energy as possible. Now, when I've done this here and I've said, okay, I've, I've got to make it incoherent. As, as we've seen, this ratio is the thing that I want to make as small as possible. So what is the best thing to do for this ratio? Well, it's to pick it from the hottest temperature possible, basically. Because if the, so for instance, if the temperature of the hot system goes to infinity, then these two will be equal and my ratio will remain the same. If I want to get something even better, so for example, a ground state even less than the excited state, that would mean a negative temperature here, which I can do, but I would have to generate that negative temperature. So I will need another machine to have created that and so then that would be in, in, exactly, yes. So you see that the, the, the resource is going in. And so somehow, so one of, the, one of the key points here is that you can always mimic something that you can do coherently. So usually when you have coherent operations, well, it's, it's not usually, it's always, and I'll go into why that is the case. So when you have coherent operations, usually you, you only look at one temperature as your resource. You have your environment temperature. So basically your environment temperature is your sink, for your heat and your resource is the fact that you can do a unitary that does not need to conserve energy. So basically the machinery that does the unitary is your source of energy. It can, it can do any unitary as you like. What you do when you go into the incoherent scenario is that suddenly your unitary is no longer the source because your unitary actually doesn't change energy at all. It's, it always commutes with the Hamiltonian. Your source now becomes the third system that you add in order to make it energy preserving. And what you find is that it always is better to have that third one be as hot as possible and so then you see your source becomes the heat that you, you draw from that additional system. So here the, the resource is the work, which is the, the energy the unitary provides. Here the resource will be the heat, which is the change in the energy of the hot temperature, hot temperature thing. Okay. Um, yes, and, and one of the nice things to see is that the limit of the hot temperature going to infinity, so beta hot going to infinity sort of takes you to the same efficiency. So efficiency of a work source. So in terms of the results and in terms of the efficiency of thermal machines that you get, when you have that the hot temperature goes to infinity, you will get the same as if you had considered that your resource instead of being a hot temperature bath was just a source of work. And um, this is actually a little tricky thing. So when, when we think of work in the in the classical sense, it has two properties. So imagine I consider what, what is work in the classical sense. I raise a weight, for instance. And there's, there are two properties of thinking of this, oh, I'm raising the state of a weight. One is that it, um, it has zero, well, it's basically the entropy, well, the two properties is, one is that the entropy is zero. So I consider, oh, my weight is usually in a deterministic state. I take it from here, I take it to another place. And the other one is that the entropy doesn't change, which might seem trivial to say. The entropy is zero always, and the entropy doesn't change. These are not the two different things. Um, but when you consider quantum source of work, these two actually become interesting and separate because I could say, well, okay, imagine I was, I'm trying to mimic a source of work on the quantum scale, right? Then I can say, well, the defining feature should be either I could make the defining feature that the entropy is zero, or I could make the defining feature the entropy doesn't change when I extract work. And the key is that the important thing about work is that the entropy doesn't change. It's not the former because this is just a small thing. So the first case where I say, oh, I want my work source to be something where the entropy is zero suggests that the work source could be, for instance, a qubit where you have P1 is equal to one, P0 is equal to zero. Or, so you could have a collection of qubits like this, where all of them are in the are in the maximally excited state. So these are all states; they are pure states. So it's it's an entropy zero source of of energy. But now the point is, 
you have you will have constructed the entropy of a qubit, right? As you change the population from one extreme to the other. And if you remember that, so the uh, well, I'm going to call it S. S is a function of P. For P, let's say as as a function of P naught or yeah, as P naught, it looks something like this. Is this graph familiar to all of you? It's, it's basically the binary entropy of a uh, of a probability. And the key part is that the rate of change here and here is actually infinite. So it actually changes infinitely fast, which means that when you extract an infinitesimal amount of work or energy from such a system or such a collection of qubits, the entropy change is actually extremely high. So this is not this is not consistent with the source with thinking about classical work because the whole point about a classical work source is that its entropy doesn't change. It's it basically provides energy at no difference in order or disorder of the universe. So it's it's an entropy zero source. So in fact, the best way to mimic a classical work source is actually one way. Ah, now I've run out of space. Let's go to the next board. is by something that actually has a very high entropy. But uh, the trade-off with having a high entropy is that it also has a property that entropy doesn't change much. So for instance, I could consider a Hamiltonian that is a very long ladder. And we will return this at some point when we discuss information and erasure. And I could consider that my initial state is a very, very wide distribution on this. So I have my initial state rho is equal to the sum over Pn, n, n. And this is a wide package. So it's a wide distribution. Now, why does this make a difference? It is, makes a difference because imagine now I use this ladder and I couple it to a qubit of, of the energy gap of the ladder. Yeah, and I do some particular unitary operation or some, some operation with that. Then at the end, when I decouple my ladder again, I'm going to expect that the, the distribution has changed. But how much can it change? It can only change by moving basically one up, one down, or remaining in the same place. So essentially at the end, my row is going to be the sum over it's going to be three terms, so it's going to be sum over n. I will call it uh, let's say q plus, and then you have p n with n minus one, n minus one plus q minus p n n plus one, n plus one, and q zero in the same state n n. So it's just a representation. So I, I've considered that now my state has gone to a mixture. So it, it got correlated with the qubit it was interacting with. And then it goes at the end, the reduced state is some mixture of having moved up, having moved down, or stayed in the same place. And here's the point. Each of these is a shifted wave packet. But if the wave packet in the first place, or the distribution in the first place was extremely wide, then all of these actually look very much similar. So they actually have a very high overlap. So this becomes then approximately the same, so rho prime, becomes the same as rho naught, in the sense that rho prime, if I take the, the overlap between rho prime and, and, and rho initial, I see that it's close to one. And this becomes better the wider and wider this one Pn is. So this is really the better equivalent of a, of a work source. Um, yes, and to conclude what I was saying there about the entropy, the one thing I, I didn't say, but this, with using the same graph, we see that the point at which the entropy of a qubit does not change is actually the middle point where the populations are the same. So there the rate of change of entropy is the same, which means that, and, and of course, if I have a collection of qubits like this, that is essentially a bath at infinite temperature where all of the populations are the same. So infinite temperature is really mimicking classical work um, rather than maximally excited states. Okay, so that was a short thing about coherent, incoherent. Uh, you have additional things. So one of the things we've already considered uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to write it down because we already have done it. Is single shot versus repeated? So you can have uh, thermodynamic scenarios where you go. Well, I'm going to consider what is the best thing I can do with a single unitary operation. So there you say I, I can create my initial states with thermal connections however I like. I can do one unitary operation. What's the best I can do? Or you can say, well, I can repeat this process. So with the qubit swap, we did this. We said what we can do with one operation and then what we can do with repeated operations. 
one of the things actually that you usually find there is that with repeated operations, and when I say with repeated, I mean when you're allowed to repeat them as many times as you like, the only thing that's relevant is really beta v or, or zv is relevant. Remember, zv is just the difference in populations. The beta v and zv are one to one. Uh, instead of writing the ratio, you write the difference between populations and the normalized populations in that subspace. And the reason for this is, well, let me talk about the other one. So with single shot, NV is also important. So the point is when you have one unitary operation that you can do and virtual qubits are involved, then the norm of the virtual qubit is actually very important because it tells you the problem, like how far towards the target state you're going to get. When you have repeated operations, this norm becomes not so important because you get to repeat it. So even if the norm is actually bad for one step, you can make up for it by just increasing the number of steps. So if you remember, there was this, at some point you, we got the expression one minus NV to the N when we were considering the state change in the qubit swap. And, and this has a property that if this gets worse and worse, you can just adjust for N and make this higher and higher so that you get the same effect. So with single shot, the norm of the virtual qubit is important, but with repeated operations, it's usually just the virtual temperature that's important because you can get as close to your target state as you like, even though in each step, it might be very slow. So that's one. And then the last thing to consider, and this is something that turns out when you, turns up when you consider the case of algorithmic cooling, for instance, is whether you have memory or not. So, so let me write down something now in a bit more of a general form. So I can imagine I have S, this is my system. And what we've considered is, well, let's say we have uh, M, I'll call this a machine. And we can have H, which is a hot, um, Hot, well, H is a, it's also part of the machine, but uh, I'm not going to give it a label. Let's call it an ancilla for now. Okay. So for instance, we had coherent where you went rho S goes to trace over the machine of U system machine, rho S tensor. Usually it's tau of the machine because it starts in a thermal state, U S M dagger, and u is arbitrary. But incoherent, for instance, would be rho s goes to trace over m and h, u, s, m, h, rho s, tensor tau m, tensor tau h, u, s, m, h, dagger. But here, u, s, m, h commutes with the Hamiltonians, the total energy h of the machine, plus the Hamiltonian of the hot path. That would be incoherent. Now, so this is all single shot. So repeated then is just, repeated is where you take rho prime uh, M, which is the final state of the machine. You reset it to tau machine and rho prime of H, you reset it to tau H. And then of course you can repeat a unitary operation or do a different one as you like. Now, what do I mean when I say memory? When I say memory, what you can do is, you can also have the situation where your machine actually has two parts. One is a part that is always reset to the thermal state between operations, but the second is a part that's actually not touched, so it's not reset. So you do the unitary on, so forget about the incoherent now, imagine I'm just talking about coherent. You do the unitary on the system and machine, and before the next step, you reset part of the machine, but there's another part that you don't have to reset. So this acts as a memory because it's allowed to sort of keep correlations and keep memory of the process that has gone on so far. So this is something that you have in algorithmic cooling. I think they're called scratch qubits, if I'm not mistaken, and they help very much. So the answer as to how cold you can get in a particular number of operations or, or even indefinitely changes very much if you have scratch qubits, so you could have 
So row S goes to, as I said, to trace, well, I've already written this, um, this thing, but then the next step here is where, tar, uh, so row M prime, the final state of the machine, it goes to trace over, I call M the machine, and M also stands for memory. So let's call R memory. So R is memory. So you trace over R, row M prime. So you, you trace over R. So this is just the final state of the, um, uh, sorry, you, you trace over, trace over M, no, M minus R. R is memory. Oh, it's a mess. W, so W is the rest. So H, the Hilbert space of the machine is equal to Hilbert space of a working material, tensor Hilbert space of the memory. So that's what I'm using. So the final state of the machine goes to, the final state of the memory remains the same. So you trace over W, but then you replace the W part by the thermal state. So W is really a working part that keeps getting thermalized and then is part of the next step, thermalized part of the next step. Whereas the R is the memory, it remains, it, well, it doesn't remain the same because it of course will be affected by the unitary, but it can remain, um, it, it sort of, it's not thermalized in between operations. So one of the easiest ways to see how this helps is, so in a past tutorial, you had the case where you coupled a qubit to an arbitrarily dimensional system. And I think the, um, this was one of the more complicated questions was to check what was the coldest temperature you could get here. And the coldest temperature was just uh, given by the Gibbs ratio of the top to the bottom of the machine. And so one of the things you can see is actually if you have this machine, but there's, you, you split the machine into two parts, the W and the R, and you, you ask, well, how cold can I get my system? You can get much cold on the system. And the reason is because what you do is within the machine, you use the part that keeps getting thermalized as your original machine, and you use that to cool the R part a lot. And then by cooling the R part a lot, when you look at it as a together, you have that the ratio of the Gibbs ratio from the top to the bottom is now much colder because you can use, um, so here, well, it's 130. So I'm not gonna go through the calculation, but I'm going to leave it to you to read anything that you like on algorithmic cooling. And what I will do actually, is post a couple of papers that talk about these different paradigms um, so that you get a flavor of how each of them helps. But um, yes, so the end result was just to give you a flavor of the different ways in which people do discrete thermal as well as construct thermal machines. And with that, I'm done. Are there any questions? No, very good. Then uh, see you on Wednesday for Patrick's lecture. I will, he will, well, he will give the lecture, but I will also be there. I'll introduce him briefly before the lecture. So, no, no. So, so Patrick gives just Wednesday lecture, but I will. I am actually teaching for so the next three weeks, other than Patrick's lecture, still. So I teach until Easter. Yeah, and then uh, after Easter, Philip takes over until the final two weeks, where I will return for clocks. Yeah. All right.